Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Today's Hello. presentation, CDL Updates, is being brought to you by the Transportation Learning Network. TLN is a program of the Upper Great Plains Transportation Institute at North Dakota State University and is a partnership with four state DOTs of North Dakota, South Dakota, Montana, and Wyoming, and the Mountain Plains Consortium, which includes eight universities in Colorado, North Dakota, South Dakota, Utah, and Wyoming. In addition to that, we are also partnering with the NDSU Upper Great Plains Transportation Institute's Commercial Vehicle Safety Center to bring you today's presentation. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Brenda Lance, who is the director for the Commercial Vehicle Safety Center, and she's going to introduce the topic and our speakers. Great. Thank you, Chris. Greetings to everyone and good morning. It is great to see so many attendees on the meeting today and thank you for taking the time to join us. Thanks as well to our speaker and panelists for today, G and Nikki from FMCSA. And thanks also to Chris and all the other staff with our Transportation Learning Network for their help in coordinating this meeting. I'd also like to acknowledge and thank the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration for the grant funding that made our work and these webinars possible. For those who don't know me, my name is Brenda Lance. I'm the Associate Director of the Upper Great Plains Transportation Institute at North Dakota State University, as well as the Program Director for our Commercial Vehicle Safety Center. Again, we're very excited to have you all join us. The webinar today with updates on FMCSA rules and programs, and in particular, the newly implemented Drug and Alcohol Clearinghouse, came from suggestions from all of you. And suggestions for topics for future webinars are always welcome. As we proceed with today's webinar, as Chris mentioned, feel free to use that Q&A box, type in any questions as they come up. And in addition, we will take questions and have discussion after the presentation as we have time. With that, it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker and panelist for today. Guy Marshall is a management analyst in the FMCSA Office of Enforcement, and Nikki McDavid is the division chief for the FMCSA CDL division. Gee, I will turn it over to you to get us started. Great. Thank you, Brenda. Hi, everybody. Thank you for um, joining us today. And I just want to go over um, the drug and alcohol clearinghouse. Uh, mainly the things that you're going to be seeing are the viewpoint of the um, impacted users. So we'll go ahead and talk about those users in just a second. Um, we, during this webinar, we're going to cover what FMCSA CDL drivers drug and alcohol clearinghouse is and how it will improve safety, who is required to use the clearinghouse and for what purposes. We'll discuss how to report violations in the clearinghouse. We'll also examine reporting return to duty information. And finally, we're going to tell you how to prepare um, for the clearinghouse. I know that we've already implemented, but um, you know, people are still um, getting situated and um, registered and all that kind of stuff. So we're going to start off with the overview of the clearinghouse. Um, as you know, uh, the clearinghouse is just going to be a database or is a database containing CDL and CLP drivers, drug and alcohol violation um, information. This information is reported by employers and medical review officers and um, those violations include positive tests, refusals, um, actual knowledge, um, and additional types of violations. It will include whether a driver has successfully um, completed their RTD uh, process um, following a violation. And then this information is not available to the general public. Only authorized users will be able to access the clearinghouse um, for specific purposes. Um, SCLAs and state law enforcement agencies will only receive driver eligibility status. That means that you will only um, find out if there is a, a driver is prohibited or if they're not prohibited, you will not find out the details of that violation information. Um, drivers uh, will be able to access their own information, but they will not be able to access the information of um, anyone else. As you all know, the clearinghouse final rule was mandated by Congress um, under MAP 21. We published the final rule in December of 2016, and the rule established those requirements for the clearinghouse. So everything that we incorporated into the clearinghouse, the functionality, um, the type of information, um, and how to access that information was all established by the final rule. And then it did identify January 6, 2020 as the implementation date. If you have not actually had a chance to read the final rule or it's been a little bit 
for a little while, then we recommend that you go ahead and refresh your memory and um, read the final rule at the link that you see on your screen. So uh, the Crane House is going to help increase safety on our nation's roadways. It will uh, provide real-time access to reported violation information, um, meaning that as soon as a violation is reported, then if somebody was to query, then you would be able to go ahead or the employer would be able to have access to that information immediately. It's going to make it more difficult for those drivers to conceal their um, drug and alcohol violations from the employers. What that means is basically, you know, I live in a tri-state area, so if I had a Maryland license, got a positive test, then I just go to Virginia and I get a new driver's license. The clearinghouse is going to go ahead and make it a little bit more, it will make it more difficult for those drivers to be able to do uh, that kind of thing or even just um, go ahead and seek a other employment because their current employer knows about their violation, but somebody else may not. Um, the clearinghouse will make it easier for those employers to meet their pre-employment um, requirements, meaning that they can they will be able to go ahead and check the clearinghouse, be able to query and find um, the information on the driver, whether they have violations, where they are in their return to duty process, and overall if they're prohibited from operating a commercial motor vehicle. And of course, for FNCSA, we're going to have more insight on compliance by the employer with the drug and alcohol testing rules. And of course, this will lead to um, safer roadways. So next, we're going to go ahead and talk about uh, using the clearing house. Uh, drivers um, here who hold a commercial driver's license or commercial learner's permit, so um, that meets they will have to meet the requirements of the CDL standards, and that's um, in accordance with 49 CFR Part 383 and the FNCSA Drug and Alcohol Testing Program under Part 382. We will be referencing um, CDL drivers, and that will include um, CLP, CLP holders as well. For the purpose of this presentation, we're using the term employers. Most employers are motor carriers or owner operators, but the term employers encompasses anyone who employs someone with a CDL or CLP. So there are employers out there such as municipalities, school districts, those kind of organizations that still employ a CDL driver. However, they may not actually have a DOT number. We also will use the term consortia, third-party administrators, or CTPAs to refer to those organizations that employers designate to manage or conduct their drug and alcohol compliance programs. You may also hear, hear uh, these agencies referred to as service agencies in official rulemaking. And then again, you'll see um, medical review officers and substance abuse professionals. Um, and then if you want to learn more um, about each of those roles, you can go ahead and um, go to the Clearinghouse website and download the user role card. Here is an overview of the actions that employers are responsible for completing in the Clearinghouse. We'll get into more detail on what those actions mean and how to do them in the Clearinghouse later in the webinar. Employer requirements may be uh, completed by a designated CTPA. For each CTPA um, that an employer wishes to designate, they must uh, the employer must authorize them to perform at least one function on the employer's behalf. That means that they will either report violations, report return to duty information, or conduct queries. They can do one or they could do two or three of those functions, whatever the employer actually designates. Assistance must be invited to register in the clearinghouse. Each clearinghouse administrator, um, for each uh, clearinghouse administrator, they will go ahead and invite an assistant, and that assistant will need to um, click on an email um, link in the uh, in the. They'll click on a link in the email that they receive um, for the invitation, and then they will be able to go ahead and complete their registration just following those steps. This is an overview of the actions that the drivers are responsible for uh, completing in the clearinghouse. Drivers only need to register for the clearinghouse to complete one of the following actions. 
responding to a consent request for a full query um, from a current or potential employer. This includes all pre-employment queries. Uh, failure to provide consent to such a request will result in the driver being prohibited from performing safety sensitive functions, including operating a CMV for that employer. And that is in accordance with 49 CFR 382-703C. This means that after um, starting in January 6th, if the driver applies for a new drive job as a CDL driver, um, they will receive a consent request for a full query and the driver will need to respond to that consent request in order to be hired to operate a commercial motor vehicle. If the driver does not plan on changing employers, um, the, they would um, still need to register for the clearing house if the employer chooses to um, conduct a full query to access their clearing house um, record. Re registered drivers may access the information recorded in their clearinghouse record, including any drug or alcohol program violations at any time. Um, the driver must be registered to designate a staff. So if the driver does have a positive test, uh, they would need to go ahead and um, register for the clearinghouse if they're not already registered, validate their CDL, and then they would designate a um, SAP so that the staff can then report information to the clearinghouse for that driver. Sorry. Uh, this is an overview of the actions that the MROs and staff are responsible for completing in the clearinghouse. You, uh, please note that MROs will only enter FMCSA DOT violations into the clearinghouse, not other DOT tests. MROs and staff can assign assistance to enter the information in the clearinghouse on their behalf. And each um, clearinghouse administrator um, that uh, can go ahead and invite that assistant. And again, the assistant would need to click on the invitation to um, complete their registration. All right, so um, next we're gonna go ahead and talk about queries and consent. Um, but before we go ahead and do that, we're gonna go ahead and talk about uh, the consent requirements of and the, the type of queries. So there are two quer types of queries for the clearinghouse. There's a limited query and then there's a full query. The limited query will be used to do the annual check for uh, currently employed drivers. And what this does is just releases in, um, whether there's information about the driver in the clearinghouse or not. So there's not gonna be any detailed information. The employer is um, required to get that consent from the driver outside of the clearinghouse. Um, and we have a limited consent request form that's um, posted on the clearinghouse website that can be downloaded for the employer's um, use. They can just go ahead and customize it and um, uh, you know, put their letterhead on it, and then if they want to tweak some of the language. The important part for the limited consent is that the employer must go ahead and specify the duration and um, the uh, frequency that a limited query would be conducted. So, for example, if um, I received a limited consent request form from ABC Trucking. That consent form would say IG on Marshall provides um, or grants um, ABC Trucking permission to run a limited query on me annually. And so that allows ABC Trucking to go ahead and run an annual query once a year for the duration. And then if they add the language for the duration of my employment, then it would be for as long as I'm employed with that company. If they don't put a, a specified time range, then it's only going to be good for one time and the employer would need to go ahead and get um, consent again. For a full query, um, 
basically those a full query will be used for a pre-employment check on a prospective or a potential driver. Uh, the full query will release detailed information about the driver. Um, so basically, if there's a drug or alcohol violation in the clearinghouse, they will get all the information about that violation, the date that the test was conducted, what the driver tested positive for, who conducted the test, um, you know, who the test was for, all that uh, detailed information, including whether the driver is in a return to duty status or not. For a full query, it does um, require specific consent. What that means is that the driver must provide electronic consent within the clearinghouse. And we're going to go into mo more details um, in just a couple minutes about that. If a driver refuses consent, the, driver, the query will not be conducted and the driver must be removed from safety sensitive functions. All right? So um, for a full query, because of the fact that the consent needs to be granted within the clearinghouse, if a driver refuses consent, the employer will be notified of that refused consent. And just a reminder that just because there's information about a driver in the clearinghouse does not actually mean that the driver is prohibited um, from um, safety sensitive functions. It just means that there is information about that driver in the clearinghouse and without a full query being conducted, the employer is not going to be able to know whether the driver um, is already in the return to duty uh, process and that they are able to actually um, perform safety sensitive functions. Okay, so we're gonna, before we go ahead and walk through the whole uh, query process, we're gonna just go ahead and touch on the query plans really quickly. There are two plans available. One is an unlimited query plan that is for 24,500. What that means is that a an employer could go ahead and run as many queries as they want for that one um, cost throughout the whole entire year. However, after 12 months from the date of purchase, the query plan will expire and the employer would need to go ahead and purchase an additional um, unlimited query plan. Majority of our employers are actually purchasing the ind individual query plan, which the cost for each query is $1.25. It doesn't matter if it's a limited or a full query, those queries do not expire. So for example, if they bought 500 queries, but they only used 250, then the remaining 250 would just go ahead and carry over to, into the next year until they've all been used. Uh, hey, can I ask a question real quick? Sure. Okay, so the question out there is for our current CDL drivers, they are required to register as a driver in the system so the employer can do a limited query. Would there ever be a scenario where current CDL driver or operator would not need to register in the clearinghouse? Yes. So a driver does not need to register in the clearinghouse if they never seek other employment or if and sorry, not or. And if they don't have any drug or alcohol violation information that's recorded in the clearinghouse. So the limited query can be done for the annual check. And I um, previously mentioned that the consent is granted by that driver outside of the clearinghouse. So the, the, what, what happened, and we'll walk through this in just a minute, is the um, driver never has a reason to go in the clearinghouse. There's no action that they actually are required to uh, take, right? However, if the driver gets a drug or alcohol violation, then um, it gets recorded in the clearinghouse. They would need to register to view their own information. They would need to re uh, register in order to provide electronic consent so a current or a potential employer would be able to view the detailed information in the clearinghouse. And then if they are seeking other employment, whether they're currently employed and just want a second job or they're just looking for another job because they're not happy where they are, they would need to register in order to provide consent so that the potential employer can do a full pre-employment query on them. Okay, thank you. Sure. All right, so once an employer purchases the query plan, um, on their dashboard, they will have a 
query plan summary screen. And this will go ahead and show that they, um, you know, how many queries that they purchased, how many uh, queries were conducted, how many are pending, and then what their available query plan balance is. Um, and then you can see on the very bottom of the screen that there's a transaction history. So every time they go ahead and buy a query plan, they will see that transaction history. And if they need a receipt under the status column, they would be able to click on the um, link that says receipt. All right, and just um, something else to note is that the employer is the only one that can actually purchase the query plans. So if they have designated a CTPA in the clearinghouse, the CTPA cannot purchase the query plan on their behalf. All right, um, and uh, the clearinghouse is the only place that the employer can purchase a query plan from. There's um, several companies out there that appear to be advertising to the employers that they can go ahead and purchase a query plan through them, and that's not true. The clearinghouse is the only place that they can actually purchase that query plan. Okay. So next, we're going to go ahead and walk through conducting a query. Um, when conducting a limited or full query on a driver, the employer will enter the driver's name, date of birth, the CDL number, and then the state and country of issuance. This information is going to get verified against FMCSA systems. So basically what's happening is that when this information is being entered, we're actually validating it through the clearinghouse first, if the CDL was validated within the last 30 days, then we're going to go ahead and stop there and the driver information should be validated um, for the purpose of the query. If the CDL um, was not validated within the last 30 days, then we're going to go, uh, send a, valid, uh, a request to SIDLIS and the CDL will um, then be validated at that point as long as the information is good. Just something to note is that when you're entering the CDL number, um, spaces and hyphens need to be removed um, because all the 51, 51 jurisdictions all have a different format for um, their CDLs. And so we've actually made it so it, we remove those, okay? Um, we have ha been having a message, and we did recently update this um, in the last week or so, is um, so the message states on there, especially when the driver is validating their CDL, to contact the SCLA to find out if there's an issue with their um, CDL. We have updated that, in, that message and we're going to be tweaking it a little bit more. We do realize that there are some drivers that will have an issue with their CDL where it's not going to validate. So we're pretty much going to send them to us here at headquarters um, and we'll go ahead and look into the issue. And then if need be, we would work with the state or ANVA or whoever else in order to resolve that issue instead of just sending the driver to um, the SDLA and finding out that on that side, it doesn't look like there's anything wrong. Okay. So um, the next thing that's going to happen is that the employer will go ahead and choose which type of query that they need to conduct. They can conduct either the limited query um, and that's going to go ahead and where they have to certify that they re did receive that consent from the driver outside of the clearinghouse. And then the other option, again, is the full query uh, that's going to release that detailed information about the, the violation that the driver may have. Okay. And then with the full query, uh, there, there's a thing called the 30-day look-back period. So basically what that means is that if I um, was looking for a job and, you know, ABC Trucking sent me for a pre-employment drug test, I came up clean, but because I was looking at a lot of different carriers, I took more than one um, pre-employment drug test. So for another carrier, 
I ended up with a positive test, right? So today I have a negative, two weeks later I have a positive test. That positive test is going to get reported by the MRO and then um, the ABC Trucking who did a query on me two weeks earlier, they're going to get notified that a driver that they previously queried um, has new information in the clearinghouse. So they can log into the clearinghouse under their account uh, and then submit a full query so that they can find out what that information is um, that was reported about me. So this is actually, um, uh, it's such a good thing because a lot of employers are like, well, you know, how am I going to know? Can I get updated every time that a driver has um, positive information? This is only applies for pre-employment um, queries. So, and we just recently had a situation, a carrier called us up and said, hey, what am I supposed to do? Um, I did a um, query two weeks ago, hired this guy, and now I just got notification that this guy has information in the clearinghouse. Um, but how do I get that information? Is it violation information? What was put in the clearinghouse? And we're like, well, you have to do the full query because you have to, and the driver has to provide you consent for um, that query so that you can find out what that information is. And they basically told me is, you know what, I'm just pulling that driver right off the road. I don't care if he didn't give me any consent right now, um, but I'm pulling him off because I can't take any chances. So we do know that the 30 day look back is working and it's working really well um, because she pulled somebody off that has, uh, that could be potentially um, um, prohibited from driving a CMV. So the next thing the employer is going to do um, with a limited query is just go ahead and click the button, uh, conduct a query. And then there's going to be two results. They'll either get the driver is not prohibited, which you'll see the green check there, um, and then they can go back to uh, their dashboard to view all of their queries. Or they'll get a result that says information uh, or a record was found and the, a full query is needed. And as you can see, there's a send consent request button right there. Um, so they can just go ahead and send the consent request and then the driver will receive notification that somebody wants to um, do a full query on them. And then just a reminder, just because there is a record found does not necessarily mean that the driver is prohibited from uh, safety sensitive functions. It just means that there is information in the clearinghouse about that driver. So when the employer uh, to, sorry, um, okay, sorry, I just wanted to make you guys dizzy just a little bit. Um, so for a full query, uh, again, they're going to verify that the CDL's information, the driver's CDL information is correct, um, and then sending the uh, consent for the full query. It's just basically, you know, telling them what they're going to do, what kind of information that they'll get, and that a query will be deducted from the query balance. Uh, once the consent request has been sent, then um, they will get a confirmation of that. So just to let you know that if the driver is registered in the clearinghouse, the, the driver is going to get an electronic notification. All right, unless they change their um, method of preferred contact to be U.S. Postal Service. All right, if the driver is not registered in the clearinghouse and a consent request has been submitted, then the driver will need will get a physical letter in the mail. So it may take a couple of weeks before the letter actually arrives at its destination, or if the driver's um, information address information in their license with the state of record is not up to date, it, they may never ever get it just because of the fact that it's um, we're sending it to an address. So it is beneficial for a driver to be registered because they will get the electronic notifications rather than physical mail. 
And if this driver does not provide consent within 24 hours, when a limited query turns into a full query, the driver will need to be removed from safety sensitive functions by the employer. So let's go ahead and say that the driver uh, was registered in the clearinghouse. He gets a notification that he has a consent request. So he will log into the clearinghouse and he will be taken to his dashboard. He will, um, in this case, you can see where the query consent request is there, right? And he would just click on the green button or the red button, depending on what he wants to do. All right, um, and then here the driver does not have any violations, so you can see that there's zero violations. However, if a violation is reported on a driver and it is, um, you know, say he just came up positive, he logged in, that circle where it says zero violations will be red and it will actually direct the driver to select a SAP. Okay. Um, something to note is that if the driver's CDL, when he registered, he or she registered, did not validate, then the driver is not going to be able to see any query consent requests. They do need to have their CDL information entered and validated, and then the query uh, consent request um, window will appear for them on their dashboard. So here is an, a screenshot of the query results for a full query. Um, and uh, as you can see, it goes ahead and shows, you know, who the employer would be, what their status is, um, and when the query was conducted, it has both the, the time and date stamp on it. Um, here is um, a little bit more detailed overview. So if you click on the view query details, it will go ahead and provide additional information. This would be the driver's view of the violation information. Um, and as we mentioned before, they can go ahead and see um, all the same information that a um, employer would see if they had conducted a full query. All right. So a couple of different things, um, you know, we walked through the process where the employer just did a single individual query. However, that's not always the most efficient way of doing things. And so, the, you know, employer may want to go ahead and do 50 queries at one time, or they might want to do 5,000. So we do have a bulk query template. It is a tab separated value spreadsheet. They would just, um, the employer or the designated TPA would just need to go ahead and use this template, um, complete the, the data fields, which will include the driver's first and last name, their date of birth, the CDL number, and then the state and country of issuance, as well as the query type. Um, they would just go ahead and uh, click on a link for the bulk query file. This window would pop up. They would just choose their file on their um, computer. And if they want, they could go ahead and enter in a description and um, hit upload. All right. So next we're going to go ahead and talk about reporting violations in the clearinghouse. Uh, just to touch and highlight um, what violations um, the employer or the designated TPA would uh, report. As it would be an alcohol confirmation test with a concentration of the 0.04% or higher. If it's a refusal to test for alcohol that's specified um, in uh, Part 40 261. And then refusal to test drug not requiring a determination by the MRO as specified as 4191. In addition to that, it would be actual knowledge um, per 382.107. And that would be for driver's alcohol use um, prior to duty, on duty, and then um, and prior to post-accident testing. Okay, or has used a controlled um, substance. And the employer will also report negative return to duty test results. Um, that will be for dr both drug and alcohol testing, and then the completion of follow-up testing. 
The MRO and staff will also be responsible for reporting um, certain information. And um, the MRO will be reporting the verified positive adulterated or substituted drug test results. They will uh, report the refusal to test for drugs requiring the determination by the MRO. And then they will also need to report any changes to a verified drug test. Um, so for the verified positive or refusal to test, those um, need to be reported within two business days. And then if they're making a change to a previously reported um, test, then that would need to be within one business day. The staff is going to report the, uh, the name of the driver and then the date that the initial assessment was, uh, was initiated and then the date of determination that of eligibility for the driver to take their return to duty test. And both of those pieces of information need to be reported by the close of, close of the business day following the date of the initial assessment or the um, date that the driver is eligible for return to duty testing. So this viewpoint is, is reporting a violation as if you were an MRO. The MRO would um, report, would enter in the company's name and address if it's available and the DOT number if it is available. Um, these are not mandatory fields. So if the MRO does not actually have this information, then um, they can go ahead and just click next. Um, and then of course, uh, not all uh, companies or employers have a DOT number. So the DOT number would not be applicable. All right, next would be the um, driver information. Again, uh, as you can tell, we're asking for the driver's name, the date of birth, the CDL number, and the state of, and country of issuance. Uh, this this um, information will be validated uh, so that we can make sure that we are attributing the violation to the correct person. There will be two opportunities um, for the CDL to be validated. However, if it does not validate, the violation can still actually be reported to the clearinghouse. The record will just be flagged for FMCSA's review so that we can look into it and find out why the CDL did not validate and then also make sure that the violation is um, attributed to the correct driver. We have been telling the MROs, the labs, and the correct collection sites that the CDL information, that is the CDL number and the state of issuance must be on the um, custody and control form. Um, so in place of the Social Security and the EIN. So in section, in step one, section C of the CCF, that's where the CDL number and the state of issuance would be annotated. On the ATF, uh, it also needs to be annotated as well. Um, we do know that for the BAT, the machines do not accommodate a CDL number and the state of issuance, and we've been telling um, folks that that's okay, just go ahead and enter the social security number as they previously have, and then just um, annotate the CDL number and state on the ATF form. All right, so if the, um, if the donor does not give the CDL information at the collection site. We've been telling the collection site that's fine. Just take the social security number, to, um, collect the specimen, and then forward it onto the lab for processing. The labs will just go ahead and continue to process the specimen and then send the results to the MRO. Once the MRO gets it, they're going to be contacting the driver anyway so that they can um, verify that positive. So they will need to request the CDL number and the state of issuance from the driver. If the driver refuses, then they've been instructed to reach out to the employer, could be the DER or it could be anybody or somebody else at the company that has that information. And then the MRO will be able to use it when they're reporting the violation. 
All right, so next is um, recording the specific information about the violation. So the reason for the test, the date of the test, um, date that the test was verified, and the specimen ID number. We do know that some specimen ID numbers um, can be reused, so that's okay. The record will just be flagged um, and with a warning message, but the MRO would still be able to go ahead and move forward forward with reporting the violation. So, um, and then on the on the right of the screen, you can see the substances listed for that the driver would test positive for. It is a multi-select, so if there's more than one substance, then um, all can be clicked. So, uh, just a recap of. Um, information specifically for refusal to take a drug test. You can see the six reasons for the test. You uh, indicate the type of the test refusal and again of the specimen ID. And then there is a spot for remarks or additional information if the um, submitter wants to go ahead and add that information. Only violations that occurred um, um, on January 6th or later will be reported to the clearinghouse. Violations that occurred prior will not be. Uh, violation information will be retained in the clearinghouse up to five years. Unless the return to duty um, test and the follow-up testing plan has not been completed. So um, in the case of a driver that reports positive today, says, you know what, I'm not going to do anything about it. I'm just going to leave the industry. So 10 years later, they decide that they want to go ahead and drive a truck again. They come back. Because they did not do the return to duty test and they did not complete their follow-up testing plan, they will still be prohibited from um, safety sensitive functions and they would not be able to go ahead and um, get a job. Um, so we, I think I mentioned earlier about reporting violation information that is not an FMCSA drug test. So if there's another mode, so for example, if a driver works for FTA um, and they also um, are covered under FMCSA, the FTA drug test will not be reported to the clearinghouse. Only FMCSA um, drug tests will be reported. Violation information can get reported to the clearinghouse regardless of whether a driver is registered in the clearinghouse or not. All right, so uh, the reporting of the violation is not contingent upon their registration. MROs and SAPs are not going to be able to review the drug and alcohol violation history of a driver. So that's because of um, privacy requirements. They're only going to be able to view the information that they reported to the clearinghouse. Hey, G. Yep. Can you um, just be careful with the background noise? So if you're tapping on your desk, whatever else, that's kind of breaking up your audio. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. So uh, a driver can go ahead and challenge information that has been reported to the driver. Uh, that is only for the accuracy of the information reported. Um, the uh, Or, for example, the report of an employer's actual knowledge. So in this situation, if a driver received a uh, traffic citation for driving a CMV uh, while under the influence, um, but it did not result in a conviction, then the driver can go ahead and request that that violation is removed from the clearinghouse. Accuracy of the test results and refusals cannot be challenged. Um, to do this, the driver is going to submit a petition um, through FMCSA's data queue system. 
uh, they're going, they'll log into the ADQs, uh, fill out a online form, upload um, supporting documentation, and then it will be routed to FMCSA to review that petition. And then after our review, we would go ahead and notify that driver uh, whether we would remove the violation, retain it, or correct any information in their record. And then we would also provide that reason for the decision. If they don't agree with us, then um, they could send a, a request for an administrative review and it's stating that they believe that FNCSA made an error. They would need to explain why they thought that FNCSA made that error and um, we would inform them of, of the decision and that would constitute as the final agency decision. So another option for the, um, Another option for users of the clearing house, if they have some complaints um, against employer staffs or MROs, they can go ahead and do that through the National Consumer Complaint Database. And um, as you can see, there's a, we're listing a, the reporting entity, so the driver, maybe the employer uh, did a query without receiving consent. So the driver could then go ahead and submit that complaint against the employer and we would look into that. Or the employer failed to report information into the clearing house in a timely manner or they just didn't do it at all. And that would be the negative results of a RTD test or the completion of the follow-up testing. If a SAP um, failed to report information um, or the SAP um, just refuse to um, accept the designation of, by that driver in the clearinghouse, they could go ahead and um, uh, submit that complaint through the NCCDB. And then the employer or designated TPA, they could go file a complaint against the MRO for not reporting information within um, the required timeframes or not reporting a change. G. Yep. A question A question on whether or not a violation happens on personal time. So if a drug or alcohol violation uh, that does affect the CDL or the permit on personal time, will that also be recorded in the clearinghouse? Um, the violation has to be where there are, um, it would be like a DUI while operating the CMV. Okay. Thank okay, you. so if, if they're operating, you know, if they're driving at their own personal vehicle and they received a DUI, then that would not be reported to the clearinghouse. Okay, thank you. So next we're gonna talk about the reporting return, uh, of the return to duty information in the clearinghouse. Just a reminder that the RTD process has not changed. Um, however, employers or their TPAs and staffs are now required to report um, information in the clearinghouse. So um, before a staff can actually report any information, the staff must be designated by that driver. I think I inferred to that earlier. Um, the driver should establish a relationship with the staff prior to designating that staff in the clearinghouse. So, um, what I mean by all this is, is that if a driver gets a positive, the employer is still required to provide that SAP list to the driver. The driver will either choose to go with one of those SAPs or, you know, someone else, and then they would establish a relationship with who that, with the SAP that they um, decided on. And then uh, they would need to be, they would need to log into their clearinghouse account and designate that SAP, and then the SAP would need to accept or approve the request, as you can see by the where the arrow is pointing, and then um, that will go ahead and start the process for the SAP to be able to return, um, start reporting information about the driver's return to duty process. So the SAP will report the driver's initial assessment. Um, completion date, and that is um, by the close of business the day following um, the completion of the assessment, and then the date that the SAP determines that driver is eligible for the return to duty testing. Um, as you can see from this screen, they would just go ahead and call up the driver, and then um, the middle 
box where it says initial assessment, they're just going to enter that date. Um, click on it and then enter the date, click on the save. And then the same thing for the date that the driver is eligible for RTD testing, click the enter date and then a box will open and they would just go ahead and enter that date and click on save. The um, driver's follow-up testing plan will not be available in the clearinghouse. Um, basically any information about the driver that is recorded in the clearinghouse must be shared with that driver. So obviously we would not want the um, follow-up testing plan to be shared with the driver. All right, so um, we've had a few common issues um, since we did um, launch the clearinghouse on January 6th. The first uh, one is, in, is basically incorrect roles. The employer registered as a TPA. So an employer obviously is in a third party and administrator. Um, so we've been receiving um, calls or questions in our email box saying, I can't designate a TPA, I can't purchase a query plan. So if they're registered as a, a CTPA, then FMCSA would need to be contacted so that we can delete their clearinghouse account. And then they would need to re-register as an actual employer. Um, another incorrect role is where the employer registered as an assistant and not as an admin. So basically they cannot designate a CTPA and they cannot invite assistance. So in order to correct that, depending on the type of employer they are, if they're linked to portal, they would just need to go ahead and um, request the correct role in their portal account to be an administrator, not an assistant. If they're um, a company that's not a um, not linked to portal, we would need to go ahead and um, fix the way they registered on on that aspect. It's just different steps. And um, employer registered as a driver. So for um, some folks, that's okay because if they are an owner operator, where they're um, leased or employed by uh, another company and they're driving or operating under that person or that entity's authority, then they can just register as a driver. However, if that owner operator is operating under their own authority, they would need to be registered as both an employer and a driver. The that owner operator needs to des must designate a CTPA in order for that CTPA to report violations that the employer incurs. Um, and then we have um, CTPA registered as an assistant. They can't accept employers' designations and they can't accept assistance. So basically what would have to, have to happen is, is that we would need to delete their account and then they would need to re-register. Other um, common issues is adding or updating the CDL. So uh, drivers have reached out to us and stated, you know, I tried to validate my CDL twice, but now I'm, I can't do it. I don't know where to go. So they would just go log into, their, into the clearinghouse, go to their dashboard and um, click the edit profile or mo my profile. And then you just click the link and they're able to go ahead and enter their information. Multiple roles, um, so some employers or even, um, you know, TPAs and other folks have multiple roles. So as you can see, there's a, a drop down box. They would just need to click on that and then switch between the roles that are appropriate. Um, and then, um, because we use login.gov as our authentication method, um, we have been getting some requests on how to change their email address and they would need to log into their um, login.gov account and be able to, and they would be able to change their email address there. Uh, email addresses cannot be changed in the clearinghouse. Okay. So for more information, just go to the Clearinghouse website. We have a lot of information there, job aids, FAQs, um, 
you know, brochures uh, specifically focused on the different users. So we have a ton in, um, of information there. If you have questions, you can contact us either through the email address or you can call 844-955-0207. Um, the other thing is, is that we uh, are establishing an email address specifically for enforcement users so that you, your emails do not actually get lost in with everybody else's and we can be able to respond to you a little, um, you know, quickly. So as soon as we have that email address up and running, we will go ahead and share that with you all. Okay, so are there questions? All right, so if anybody has any questions, go ahead and again, use the Q&A to type those questions in. Uh, as far as the handout materials, they will be available to download. And uh, we, what we could do is we could actually email them to you once uh, the presentation is over. Uh, so we could do those. And then we could also provide a, a link so that you can download them on a Google Drive. So we could certainly look at doing that for those who are outside of our TLN network. Hey, G, so if an employee signs up at his employer, do they have to sign up with a part-time job also? And this will come up as they have drivers who occasionally drive for weekend jobs. Okay, just make sure I want, I just want to make sure I understand the question. If an employer drives on the side do, and they're registered as an employer, do they also need to be registered as a driver? So if the employee at, at, a, at an employer, um, so they're already signed up uh, as an employee with that employer. If that employee or that driver operator takes a part-time job, will they then have to also register? Okay. Sign up. So a driver is only going to be registered once in the clearinghouse and they're not actually linked to a specific employer. So they're, they're separate. Um, and so if they do go ahead and get a part-time job somewhere else, then that employer would be responsible for reporting any violations or doing queries under that umbrella, whereas the employer that the driver is primarily employed with would also still be responsible for reporting violations or um, querying that driver under their umbrella. Okay. And then uh, the next one is from a, one of our participants is at the CDL training school and they've been sending students prior to receiving their permit for drug testing. And it seems as if they should be doing that after they get their permit. Um, after they get their CLP, we should be doing a limited query to have on file for each CLP student. So that's kind of the question is, should they be doing it before or after? And then should they be doing a query? Okay, so we just recently received new guidance about um, CDL schools. So in this instance with the CDL school, um, the CDL school is an employer for the instructors. However, the students are, they're not the employer for the students. So there would not be a query responsibility. If you have any questions, again, type those into the Q&A. And while we're waiting for some questions to come in, Brenda, do you have any closing comments you would like to make before I do some of the housekeeping closing comments? Sure. Thanks, Chris. And thanks again, G, for your presentation discussion today. That was a lot of great information, which I think will be extremely useful. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, this webinar is part of our Commercial Vehicle Safety Center. So you will be able to, I know you mentioned as well, uh, Chris, some options for the slides, but you will also be able to view the slides and the recording from this webinar, as well as those from past webinars we've had on our uh, Commercial Vehicle Safety Center website. And I did post the link for this site in the chat box if you want to take a look and, and mark that down. Um, another goal of our center is to provide resources and assistance to help establish partnerships between agencies, industry, universities to improve commercial motor vehicle safety. So if you're interested in forming a partnership or if you'd like any more information, you know, please reference our website or feel free to contact me directly. 
Um, in addition, I wanted to announce that we will be hosting another Commercial Vehicle Safety Summit, uh, primarily for the FMCSA Western Region states. Later this year, on December 1st and 2nd in downtown Denver, there is a Save at the Date notice on our website as well. Um, the focus of the summit is going to be to share research and best practices to improve data quality, as well as the collection and use of commercial motor vehicle data. So further information will be provided in the upcoming months via email as well as on our website as well. And finally, after this webinar, you'll have the opportunity to complete a short evaluation survey. So please take the time to do this, provide your feedback, um, any suggestions you may have for possible future topics for webinars or for the upcoming summit, that'd be great. And just thanks again for your attendance today. And I will turn it over to Chris to close the session unless there's any more questions. Okay, thanks, Brenda. And that was a excellent. Uh, fantastic response to where you to get the presentation to download a copy of it. Um, on the Commercial Vehicle Safety Center site, I did uh, put the link in the Q&A as well. So if you want to go ahead and copy that link and then bookmark it so that you'll have that for um, future reference. And that is primarily for our non-transportation learning network audience. So if you are not in the states of North Dakota, South Dakota, Wyoming, Montana, and part of the Departments of Transportation or the local government, local agency group, um, then that will be your resource to be getting the information. Everybody else as far as the Transportation Learning Network goes, so again, the DOTs, the counties, the cities, townships, uh, and any other consultant engineers working for the Department of Transportation or those local governments, you will be able to access the recording and all the materials in our learning management system, which is where you went to register for this training. So, gee, there is a question here. It is, is there written guidance explaining that students of a truck driving school are not considered employees of the school? No, not yet. <clears throat> but we'll be, um, we're working on getting that out there. Okay. And next question is, what if you work for a state government entity and are a CDL holder? Do you still need to register and does our office register or do we as individuals? Yes, so even if the government entities are not exempt, so if uh, they employ a CDL driver, they would register as an employer um, and they would be required to do the um, annual checks as well as pre-employment. And then um, the driver, you know, depending upon their situation, as we had talked about before, would either register or not, or not be required to register. So. Okay, again, if there are any questions while I'm, while I'm talking, go ahead and type those in. Uh, in, in closing though, uh, I would like to thank everyone for their time and their attention today during this TLN event. Thank you, G, for sharing this information. It was very, very valuable information and hopefully everybody had some good takeaways from that. Visit our website at translearning.org for upcoming learning opportunities and to access our learning management system. If there's something you see out there that is not necessarily of interest to you, but could be of interest to one of your coworkers or partners, please share that with them as well, because we believe that sharing is caring. And if there's a topic out there that you believe would be beneficial for you or your coworkers, uh, take the opportunity to share that with them so they have the opportunity to attend as well. So not seeing any additional questions coming in, uh, G, thank you again, Brenda, thank you. And, thank you. Um, we will go ahead and close out today's session and everybody have a safe day.